and welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Dean Obidala. Today we are with Heather Cox Richardson, a historian, a professor at Boston College, the author of the newsletter, wildly popular, which I get, Letters from an American, and author of several books, including her new book, Democracy Awakening, Notes on the State of America. Heather, watch, welcome to Salon Talks. Lovely to be here. So it, let's talk first, because so much of your book is about where we are today, how we get out of here, the rise of authoritarianism. But I saw an interview where you made a really interesting point that historians just don't tell what happened. You tell why it matters. And I think that's more important today than ever. Why is that your philosophy? So there's a really important distinction between journalists who tell you what happened, and that's their job, and they do right. a very good job at it, and historians who look at that information and use it to make observations about the way societies change. That, what, that's what history does, is we take a look at how societies change, whether it's great men or whether it's political movements or whether it's economics. And so we take a look at all the things that happen on the ground and put it in a much larger context to draw conclusions about what it says about societal change, which of course is what we're all ultimately interested in. It's interesting, you're a historian, often we think of history far long ago. You're living through a unique time in history. How does that impact you? And do you have a sense of that? Absolutely. It, it is unique in many ways that I hope we'll talk about. But one of the things I think that people like about the newsletter is that I always have history in mind. Mm. So when the news hits me every day, I, I literally sit there at night and say, if I were a graduate student in 150 years, what do I want to know about what happened today? Because that's literally how some of my books were. I would right. say, you know, what happened 150 years ago on this date and pray that somebody had kept a diary while well, I'm keeping that diary. That's remarkable. That's your motivation for Letters from an American, which I do get every day. So let's talk about your book. I mean, in your book, you you map, you map the trajectory of the modern day conservative movement. I mean, you have, you have Reagan, before that Southern strategy of Nixon, through Reagan, through today. Is there a common through line where you see the rise of authoritarianism that is more organic, that people missed, or is this new what Trump is doing? Yeah, I'm laughing a little bit because it's sort of a grab bag of everything if you put it that way. The book tries to look at how we got here, right. where here is, and how we get out. And that through line is, and, and quite unexpectedly, that's not the book I intended to write, is the way that the modern day movement conservative movement, which is not inherently intellectually conservative, it's actually quite radical and always has been, used language and history to convince Americans to give up on democracy. Then the, the Trump years are, are a little bit different in that he becomes a strong man very quickly and turns that intellectual and rhetorical strategy into a movement. And of course, the, the, the end of the book is how we reclaim both language and history to get out of that. But, but yes, there has the, the, the people who think that Trump happened from nowhere and is the sole cause of our current malaise are completely missing the previous almost 100 years in which there was a concerted movement to overturn the concept that the government should work for ordinary Americans. And, you know, I think a lot of us thought that that was so ingrained in both the Republican and the Democratic parties that the government should, you know, regulate business and protect a basic social safety net and promote infrastructure and protect civil rights that we didn't think it was going anywhere. And you still hear it nowadays when people are like, they're never coming for Social Security. And people like me and you are sitting there saying, they are literally writing documents saying we're coming for Social Security. And the answer to that among a number of people is, well, they don't really mean it. <laughs> you know, where do you go with that? At their own peril. If you're, if you're not going to believe what you're hearing from them, they're telling you what they're going to do, Republicans. That's the big thing. Republicans have never, it's never been a big surprise. It's like, oh, they were serious. Yes. It's more like that. Like, oh, they, they're not kidding. So now we have to take them literally. You know, in the second part of your book, part two, you talk about the authoritarian experiment. It opens with Trump slithering down the escalators. I like to put, I like slithering. <laughs> Coming down the escalator. When was the first time you saw signs in Trump that troubled you beyond normal politics over the top? And, and not just a racist stuff, but actually a threat to our democratic republic. Well, so I should confess I don't watch television. Okay. So in, for me, a lot of what he was doing was, from the beginning, uh, theoretical. Like, you could see all the pieces. So I was very concerned from that very beginning, but in, in a different way, I think, than perhaps many people were, because I have never thought that Trump was a politician. Mm -hmm. He has always been, to me, a salesperson, a salesman. And what he was doing, I thought, and I still think of him, literally I'm seeing this in my mind, as a mirror 
of a certain population. And that population in 2016 did in fact want better economic policies. People forget that Trump called for better and cheaper health care, mm -hmm. for bringing back manufacturing, for closing the loopholes that were making rich people not pay taxes, you know, for all the sorts of more moderate uh, economic issues that, in fact, Biden has put into 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 place. Um, so he had that, but he also had that racism and sexism in a really big way. And that mirror being held up to me to that population was a huge red flag, because it was very clear he was not going to be even a traditional Republican at that point, uh, which already had me concerned because they were quite deliberately bu building an oligarchy. So that, from the very beginning, seemed to me to be a real problem. Also in your book, you touch on something that we're seeing happen today. Is the right authoritarians wanted to rewrite history. Can you share, as a historian, why authoritarians would want to rewrite history in a version that helps them? So this is actually, I think, a really interesting point, and that is that it's not simply a question of saying, I want you to learn my history. If you conceive of American history or any country's history as being perfect in the past, it's, it deliberately serves authoritarians because what that says is that we could go back to that past if only we followed these certain immutable laws. So they're either uh, divine laws or laws that are handed down by nature, and I know how to do that. My enemies don't. They're trying to mess up those divine laws. So if we can believe that the past was great, and we can make America great again, which by the way is a Reagan phrase before it's a, a Trump phrase, if only we follow these you know, universal laws for our country to get back to that. What that says is that I alone know how to do that. It's a really authoritarian vision. In contrast, a small d democratic vision says our country actually has always been a work in progress. It is always changing and it is inclusive of every voice, not just John Adams. Uh, that is, and the idea that, that we are always finding new things, we're always looking at society differently because of the moments in which we live, we're always thinking about different ways to move society forward, that is a vision that is inclusive of all of our past, all of our present, but also our future. And it's much more exciting than, you know, we could all go back and, and wear, wear pointy hats. So is it they want to clean up the, the sins of the past because then they can sell it better to people? Because like we have right now, numerous states are Republican control states to the critical race theory bans and book bans. And they're rewriting things that cause anyone to feel uh, anxious or discomfort in school, which I felt all the time, but I couldn't ban subject matter because of that. So <laughs> Don't it, start me on math. <laughs> right, right, math, exactly. So, so, so people can understand from a historical point of view, is it deeply alarming? Is this just consistent with authoritarian movements in other parts of the nation as well or through history? Uh, it is in alignment with other authoritarian movements in other countries, for sure. And it's actually a political theorist, Hannah Arendt, who talks a lot about this in her Rise of Totalitarianism and how they use that. But, but just to be clear, they're not cleaning up the American past, the bad parts of American past. They're saying there aren't bad places in the American past. That, in fact, things like enslavement or things like uh, race riots or, I mean, we could just make this whole list. They were a few bad actors. The, the reality was always this trajectory toward triumphant futures. And that is, you know, really deeply serves this concept that my people are all the chosen people and everybody else is trying to mess us up. It's remarkable. So let's- Intellectually, it's actually quite cool. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're living through it. Yes, it is a time that, I've never felt more of a sense of that being involved in political discussions, writing articles, is truly a form of activism than the, the years of Trump through today. And I thought when he was gone, I'm like, okay, it's done. Especially after January 6th, we have this insurrection, an act of domestic terrorism, as the FBI director has, has characterized it, all by Trump people, for Trump, plan B. I thought, I'm not naive, I thought that was the end. I thought he goes away and America goes like, we can't do this. If you would have told me then, Two and a half years later, he's the leading Republican candidate. They love him. And that that's where we are as a nation. I would not have believed. I'd be like, there's no way. I would. So what did I miss about my fellow Americans that they were predisposed to accept an authoritarian, even if they don't understand the academic definition of what's going on? I'm not, not being snooty about it. I mean, like, they just like him. They don't care what it means. 
Well, I think it's more than like him and don't care. I think they're, he is part of their identity mm -hmm. at this point, that they have internalized him to the point that he can't be ripped away. And my comparison is always to um, uh, Bellatrix Lestrange in um, the Harry Potter books. You know, the, the worse that Voldemort is to her and her family, the tighter she clings to him. And this, again, authoritarian scholars talk about this, that once you have started to, to to poison your own soul by buying into an, to somebody who's abusing others, you can't turn away from that without admitting that you're the one who's the problem. But I think I did the same thing, and I think what both of us missed was not our fellow Americans, and, and I really feel viscerally about this. It was the leadership of the Republican Party. They absolutely had that moment to, to call him out and they didn't, they legitimized him. You know, when, when Kevin McCarthy went and had, you know, and paid homage to him, mm -hmm. and when Mitch McConnell voted to acquit in the second impeachment trial, and then, then tried to give that speech saying, oh, now he can go in front of the courts, uh, the, they, the senators in the Republican Party could have stopped him any time they wanted from 2015 on, and they didn't do it. And that, to me, is the big story right there. And, and now I'm, I'm afraid their moment has passed, that they are no longer relevant to any of this discussion because that population has taken on a, a fury and a power of its own that they can no longer control. You, you mentioned the Republican Party normalizing Donald Trump. Where does the role of the corporate media come in in where we are now, especially post-January 6th, in that treating Donald Trump increasingly like a candidate? like a normal candidate, um, what, what role do they play in where we are today? So I always hate to, to criticize the media because it's a very hard job, as you and I both know. Sure. But uh, there is, I think, a lack of understanding of the fact that there has been a concerted effort since the 1980s to push the idea that in order to be fair, you have to present two sides as if they are equal. And that is a real issue for me, obviously, because they're not equal right now. You know, we were just talking, when we are recording this, we are coming up on a government shutdown, mm -hmm. and that is often being covered as a Congress problem or a Biden problem. And it is literally the Republicans in the House of Representatives who cannot get their acts together. And it doesn't make it more fair to say, oh, wait, we have to put the, de the Democrats in this as well, or the fact that Trump is an authoritarian versus the fact that, that Joe Biden is three years older than him. Those are not equal. So I really wish the media would be better about recognizing not only that this is a, a big issue uh, where we are historically, but also that I think people really want to know that. I mean, the argument is this won't sell papers, but I disagree with that. I think people are interested in where we are in this moment. I agree with you. I, I think people are very, People who are concerned are deeply concerned. The, the ratcheting up of concern that we had in 2020 before that election has now returned to the point where we're like, Trump is their nominee. How did we get here? How did this happen? And the media, we think back to the 2016 campaign, then the head of CBS said, Donald Trump's not good for America, but he's damn good for CBS. And literally said, the money's rolling in. Keep it going, Donald. And I feel like, I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, is your sense as a historian that our current media, and we'll use it in bigger scope here, all of them, unf unf fairly or unfairly, is not equipped to deal with the rise of an authoritarian, arguably fascist movement on U.S. soil? Or is it so ratings driven, it doesn't matter, they don't care? I mean, what is your take? I don't know the answer to that. I'm not part of, of that world at all. Um, I, I'm a, a consumer of it and concerned about it. I will say one of the things that I think is interesting right now is, I don't know if you feel this way, but I don't find, and, and I, I, I think this is arguable, but I don't find Trump interesting anymore. You know, it, and I write every night, and many times it would be easy to write what his latest antics are, right. and I'm just bored. You know, I feel like you remember every once in a while you'd have a shock jock that got thrown to the top of the ratings because he said stuff nobody could believe, and there comes right. a point when it's just the same thing again and again. And I wonder, if you watch closely, as, as obviously I do, you are seeing the rise of Certainly people, very good writers outside the mainstream media mm -hmm. um, who are really grappling with these issues, but also a number of outlets are taking on people who are writing in a very different way than, um, than their, their compatriots have been. And I take a little bit of hope from that. And, and you know, as I think I said on Twitter the other day, I know we follow each other, you know, I think there's actually, if it's comforting to you people, I think there's actually money in this to actually cover <laughs> these issues because I think we're all bored with what Trump is doing.
although we've got the 2025 project, which has gotten coverage, but not nearly as much as it maybe should. And that, I think, is, again, to go back to what we were talking about before, they are telling us what they're going to do in that project, which says we want Trump or someone like him mm -hmm. to destroy our nonpartisan government and replace it with loyalists who will enforce Christian nationalism. Yep. And, <laughs> and that's where we are. And, you know, deep down, I wonder if there are actually Americans who believe that it, whatever it's going to be, authoritarianism, fascism, can actually happen here. Like deep down, they don't think it can happen. The same way you mentioned, some, despite the words, don't think their social security is at risk. And, and that concerns me. And, and I don't know how to reach people who don't, who just, they're busy in their lives. They're not pro-Trump. They're just busy in their lives. They don't read your newsletter, which they should. They don't read my articles. Any sense? Because your third part of the book is reclaiming America. And that's the key thing. We're not going to give in. How do we reclaim this? I think a lot of people are paying attention who weren't before. And to, to go back to a little bit what you said before there, are there people who recognize that this could happen? Yes, there are a lot of them who want it to happen because the whole idea of the evangelical movement has been to replace our democracy with a theocracy, and that's exactly what they're being promised. And, you know, I, I many, many years ago now was a waitress in Oklahoma, and I was the only one on the floor who wasn't an evangelical Christian. And this is the world that they wanted, and this was two generations ago, right? So there, this is deeply ingrained in a number of people who want that. They are a minority and a shrinking minority. The trick is to make sure other people who don't want that are waking up to it, and I think they are. Look at the, the labor movement that is suddenly right. coming out of nowhere. Look at young people turning out screaming for Vice President Kamala Harris. I'm a big fan of Kamala Harris, but she is a vice president. Who turns out for a vice president, right? They're, by definition, their role is, is to ascend to power under really bad circumstances. Um, the number of people who are supporting um, sort of gra grassroots movements into pushing back against book banning, running for, for local offices, running for school boards, uh, showing up to all sorts of meetings to organize voters. I mean, I, I do think that there is a, a movement underway, and, and it's one I wouldn't have articulated as recently as two months ago, but it certainly seems to be the case. And that is, that's very heartening. I mean, do you see the argument, because President Biden is, according to reports, is going to be making democracy and protecting it one of the themes of 2024 campaign, and I think that's remarkable. He should do that. Is intertwined in that too, the idea of reproductive freedom, academic freedom? Is this all, because I think sometimes people just think of democracy as being able to vote, but to me it's much broader than that. Well, yes, it is. And I, and it, first of all, Biden has made this point really since um, the, the Unite the Right rally in, in 2017. I mean, that's what woke him up and said, I got to get back in the game. That itself is very interesting. So I think that's true, but I think what you're identifying is what you said earlier. So many of these things we just assumed we're going to stay in play. Academic freedom, right? you know? And yet, of course, there's been that faction on the right that has been trying to get rid of that since 1951, when William F. Buckley Jr. wrote, you know, the God and Man at Yale, the superstitions of academic freedom, the idea that that was not a good thing, that we needed to get rid of that and really force people to embrace Christianity and what he called free market capitalism or, or, or individualism. And you know now that is has been embraced by a major political party, and I think that 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 recognition a lot of people have not been willing to to recognize that some still aren't. You know when when we talk about um, you know Trump saying that if he gets back in power he's going to use the power of the presidency to punish and imprison his enemies. A number of people I've heard say he doesn't really mean that. And I thought when uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, came out recently and said, yes, I expect I will go to jail, that was an, a moment. And it has gotten play uh, and, and press. And I think maybe people are starting to recognize that, yeah, they really did mean it. And I think the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health decision really emphasized that. They really did mean they were going to get rid of reproductive rights. To me, that's probably one of the biggest changes for people to understand that this is all very real and that their agenda is not talking points or red meat to raise money or get people to come out. It's to change things. It's to impose their religion as law on this land and next comes access to birth control that they don't approve of and the list goes on and on. I mean, with all that, like we're in a, in a dark period, but a hopeful period, I get a sense. You know, in your book, Democracy Awakening, you give us that third chapter about what we can do and you look back at the, the founders. Are you optimistic personally? Yep. And tell us why. 
I'm optimistic, first of all, because we have been here before, mm -hmm. and we have the American people. What's that saying about how the American people do, finally do the right thing after they've tried everything else? Right. And you look at the 1850s. If you had looked at America in 1853, when only white men could vote, you would have seen a country that was rapidly increasing uh, human enslavement, not only through the South, but also in the West, and soon to be national, and I could explain that, but it's pretty clear that's what was going on, with the principle that, it, that the United States would become a leader in a global movement to, to push an economy, an extractive economy, based on human enslavement. By 1854, they have managed to push that across the United States with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. By 1856, there was a political party that decimates the other two political parties in the North to, to stand against that idea. By 1859, you have Abraham Lincoln rising and, and talking about the ideology of that party to, to recenter mm -hmm. the Declaration of Independence. By 1861, he's in the White House. He's elected in 60. 1861, he's in the White House. And in 1863, he gives the Gettysburg Address, which rededicates the nation to a new birth of freedom based on the Declaration of Independence and the idea that everybody must be treated equally before the law and have a right to a say in their government. That's less than a decade we go from the idea that a few rich guys should control everybody else to the government should work for ordinary Americans and everybody should be treated equally. And, and only white men could vote. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what's truly amazing about that. In this moment, and, and we have things that are on the negative side in this moment, but in this moment, we still have black Americans, people of color, and women who do actually still get to have a st say. So I do not see this as insurmountable. I really don't see it as insurmountable. That's important. And, and very last thing, and with the idea of people watching who, who want to do something, what, what can they do as we the people in this fight against authoritarianism and preserving our democracy and our democratic republic. Well, some people always talk about voting and giving money to candidates and all that is true, but I believe, yes, that all that is very true, but I believe that the way you change society is by changing the way people think. And one of the things that people who disagree with the takeover of our government by the Christian nationalists or by authoritarians I have not been doing because we thought it was safe was talk about the principles of democracy talk about caring about being treated equally before the law, talk about, and this was a big one for me, the fact that our police officers should not break someone's back when they arrest them. I mean, aside from everything else. Right. And take up oxygen, to, you know, defend our d democracy by taking up oxygen and talking about the things that you believe in. Because that's really how you change minds is on a one-to-one -one basis with people that you know. Um, the idea of, of big movements is a great one, but we know as political scientists that the way you really change people's minds is when people they care about talk to them about things that are important to them. The one-to-one -one stuff, and, and I, the idea that people have to believe that they can effectuate change is, is very important. And you know, wrapping up, there's, to paraphrase a quote from RFK that I like, the idea that few of us have the power to bend history on our own, but together we can collectively write the generation, the history of this generation, our generation, whatever generation it might be. So that's what we're going through. So again, the book, Democracy Awakening, right here by Heather Cox Richardson. Uh, it's a really good read, very timely. It was great meeting you, and, and I enjoy reading your newsletters. I will read, I read today's, and I look forward to reading tomorrow's Letters from American. Talk to you soon, hopefully. Thank you very much.